typed into the borrower's account as bank credit. The borrower then writes a check on that bank credit to buy the used car. Step 2. The seller then deposits this newly created $10,000 at her bank. Unlike the high-powered government money deposited at the central bank, this newly created credit money cannot be multiplied by the reserve ratio. Instead, it's divided by the reserve ratio. At a ratio of 9 to 1, a new loan of $9,000 can be created on the basis of the $10,000 deposit. Step 3. If that $9,000 is then deposited by a third party at the same bank that created it or at a different one, it becomes the legal basis for a third issue of bank credit, this time for the amount of $8,100. Like one of those Russian dolls where each layer contains a slightly smaller doll inside, each new deposit contains the potential for a slightly smaller loan in an infinitely decreasing series. Now, if the loan money created is not deposited at the bank, the process stops. That's the unpredictable part of the money creation mechanism. But more likely, at every step, the new money will be deposited at a bank, and the reserve ratio process can repeat itself over and over until almost $100,000 of brand new money has been created within the banking system. All of this new money has been created entirely from debt, and the whole process has been legally authorized by the initial reserve deposit of just $1,111.12, which is still sitting untouched at the central bank. What's more, under this ingenious system, the books of each bank in the chain must show that the bank has 10% more on deposit than it has out on loan. This gives banks a very real incentive to seek deposits in order to be able to make loans, supporting the general but misleading impression that loans come out of deposits. Now, unless all the successive loans are deposited at the same bank, it cannot be said that any one bank got to multiply its initial high-powered money reserve almost 90 times by issuing bank credit out of nothing. However, the banking system is a closed loop. Bank credit created at one bank becomes a deposit in another, and vice versa. In a theoretical world of perfectly equal exchanges, the ultimate effect would be exactly the same as if the whole process took place within one bank. That is, the bank's initial central bank reserve of a little over $1,100 allows it to ultimately collect interest on up to $100,000 the bank never had. If that sounds ridiculous, try this. In recent decades, as a result of steady lobbying by the banks, the requirements to make a reserve deposit at the nation's central bank have all but disappeared in some countries, and actual reserve ratios can be much higher than 9 to 1. For some types of accounts, 20 to 1 and 30 to 1 ratios are common. And even more recently, by using loan fees to raise the required reserve from the borrower, banks have now found a way to circumvent reserve requirement limitations entirely. So, while the rules are complex, the common sense reality is actually quite simple. Banks can create as much money as we can borrow. Despite the endlessly presented mint footage, government-created money typically accounts for less than 5% of the money in circulation. More than 95% of all money in existence today was created by someone signing a pledge of indebtedness to a bank. What's more, this bank credit money is being created and destroyed in huge amounts every day as new loans are made and old ones repaid.
banks can only practice this money system with the active cooperation of government. First, governments pass legal tender laws to make us use the national fiat currency. Secondly, governments allow private bank credit to be paid out in this government currency. Thirdly, government courts enforce debts. And lastly, governments pass regulations to protect the money system's functionality and credibility with the public while doing nothing to inform the public about where money really comes from. The simple truth is that when we sign on the dotted line for a so-called loan or mortgage, our signed pledge of payment, backed by the assets we pledge to forfeit should we fail to pay, is the only thing of real value involved in the transaction. To anyone who believes we will honor our pledge, that loan agreement or mortgage is now a portable, exchangeable, and saleable piece of paper. It's an IOU. It represents value and is therefore a form of money. This money the borrower exchanges for the bank's so-called loan. Now a loan in the real world means that the lender must have something to lend. If you need a hammer, my loaning you a promise to provide a hammer I don't have won't be of much help. But in the artificial world of money, a bank's promise to pay money it doesn't have is allowed to be passed off as money, and we accept it as such. Once the borrower signs the pledge of debt, the bank then balances the transaction by creating, with a few keystrokes on a computer, a matching debt of the bank to the borrower. From the borrower's point of view, this becomes loan money in his or her account, and because the government allows this debt of the bank to the borrower to be converted to government fiat currency, everyone has to accept it as money. Again, the basic truth is very simple. Without the document the borrower signed, the banker would have nothing to lend. Have you ever wondered how everyone, governments, corporations, small businesses, families, can all be in debt at the same time and for such astronomical amounts? Have you ever questioned how there can be that much money out there to lend? Now you know, there isn't. Banks do not lend money. They simply create it from debt. And as debt is potentially unlimited, so is the supply of money. And as it turns out, the opposite situation is also true. Isn't it astounding that despite the incredible wealth of resources, innovation and productivity that surrounds us, almost all of us, from governments to companies to individuals, are heavily in debt to bankers? If only people would stop and think, how can that be? How can it be that the people who actually produce all the real wealth in the world are in debt to those who merely lend out the money that represents the wealth? Even more amazing is that once we realize that money really is debt, we realize that if there was no debt, there'd be no money. If this is news to you, you are not alone. Most people imagine that if all debts were paid off, the state of the economy would improve. It's certainly true on an individual level. Just as we have more money to spend when our loan payments are finished, we think that if everyone were out of debt, there would be more money to spend in general. But the truth is the exact opposite. There would be no money at all. There it is. We are totally dependent on continually renewed bank credit for there to be any money in existence. No loans, no money, which is what happened during the Great Depression. The money supply shrank drastically as the supply of loans dried up.
And that's not all. Banks create only the amount of the principal. They don't create the money to pay the interest. Where is that supposed to come from? The only place borrowers can go to obtain the money to pay interest is the general economy's overall money supply. But almost all that overall money supply has been created exactly the same way. as bank credit that has to be paid back with more than was created. So everywhere there are other borrowers in the same situation, frantically trying to obtain the money they need to pay back both principal and interest from a total money pool which contains only principal. It is clearly impossible for everyone to pay back the principal plus interest because the interest money doesn't exist. This can even be expressed by a simple mathematical formula. The big problem here is that for long-term loans such as mortgages and government debt, the total interest far exceeds the principal. So unless a lot of extra money is created to pay the interest, it means a very high proportion of foreclosures in a non-functioning economy. To maintain a functional society, the rate of foreclosure needs to be low. And so, to accomplish this, more and more new debt money has to be created to satisfy today's demands for money to service the previous debt. But of course, this just makes the total debt bigger, and that means more interest must ultimately be paid, resulting in an ever-escalating and inescapable spiral of mounting indebtedness. It is only the time lag between money's creation as new loans and its repayment that keeps the overall shortage of money from catching up and bankrupting the entire system. However, as the bank's insatiable credit monster gets bigger and bigger, the need to create more and more debt money to feed it becomes increasingly urgent. Why are interest rates so low? Why do we get unsolicited credit cards in the mail? Why is the U.S. government spending faster than ever? Could it be the stave-off collapse of the entire monetary system? A rational person has to ask, can this really go on forever? Isn't a collapse inevitable? Money facilitates production and trade. As the money supply increases, money just becomes increasingly worthless unless the volume of production and trade in the real world grows by the same amount. Add to this the realization that when we hear that the economy is growing at 3% per year, it sounds like a constant rate, but it's not. This year's 3% represents more real goods and services than last year's 3% because it's 3% of the new total. Instead of a straight line, as is naturally visualized from the words, it is really an exponential curve getting steeper and steeper. The problem, of course, is that perpetual growth of the real economy requires perpetually escalating use of real-world resources and energy. More and more stuff has to go from natural resource to garbage every year, forever, just to keep this system from collapsing. What can we